apparently today we're going to be talking about gypsies. So that is uh, generally where we're going to be going. Um, of course, uh, it is an interesting question of who are, what, what, what is gypsy culture? What is gypsy religion? Uh, who are the gypsies in general? The problem is, is that it's very difficult, you may not know this, to tabulate just how many gypsies there happens to be. Uh, yes, uh, there's estimations, like, for example, in, in Europe, they say maybe about 10 million. In the United States, they'll say about a million. In Brazil, they'll say 800,000. But they don't know. Uh, in many cases, people don't put down uh, the fact that they're gypsy on various senses and other ways. So we don't actually know how many gypsies there happens to be out there, which makes them rather mysterious. There are, there are also sometimes in some countries, there are taboos that are associated with gypsies, which is rather unfortunate. And that is another reason why many will keep their identity uh, uh, private, quiet. And that's too bad, too, because it is very much a rich culture. But the gypsies, unfortunately, have gone through so much in the way of persecutions. And when it comes to identity of the gypsies, even though there's a multiplicity of different kinds of, of subcultures within uh, the, 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 the gypsy uh, uh, general statement of who they are, the problem is, is that uh, especially after World War II, it really did break the identity of many gypsy traditions. And so the question is, how many of these traditions continue to this day, and so how many stopped as a result of, of World War II? It's, it is un rather unfortunate. One interesting point is that sometimes many of the more traditional perspectives did survive in the United States because uh, they were going through the uh, systematic destruction that happened under Adolf Hitler and others of the uh, various totalitarian uh, regimes. But let's, let's go ahead and go into definitions. To begin with, it's time for us to talk about labels, right? Uh, sometimes gypsies are called Romani, right? Uh, sometimes Rome, and sometimes gypsies. Uh, first of all, uh, today, the people are typically called Roma, uh, understood as a noun, while the language and culture of the Rom or the Roma is known as the Romani. With that said, uh, often the term Romani is used as a noun for the people as well. So uh, there is some flexibility that we have to understand. As for the designation, excuse me, gypsy. This derives from the word Egyptoi, which means Egyptian, uh, with the belief that the Roma were uh, itinerant Egyptians, believe it or not. Uh, others uh, created the legend, a legend that uh, the uh, gypsies were exiled from Egypt uh, because they hid the baby Jesus from authorities. Uh, well, there are uh, like I said, we're not sure about the amount of uh, Romani today. Some will say 14 million, but we're not sure. So I can't really say uh, precisely. Uh, many gypsies do still speak their ancestral language, Romani. Uh, it is estimated that about 2 million do so. But with that said, uh, this language is broken up in many various dialects. So let's talk about the question of the origins of the gypsies. This is interesting for me. Um, it's no longer a debate. For a long time, it was, but no longer. And I'm going to go over that in a systematic way. The gypsies originated in India. I will repeat, gypsies did indeed originate in India. Uh, we'll go over uh, the pillars of evidence. I'll go... Uh, over three different points that will demonstrate their origins. Uh, first, number one, we know the gypsies came from India 
uh, based upon stories connected to the gypsies as they migrated uh, from the subcontinent towards Europe. We'll talk about that in more detail later, but we'll go over some bits and pieces now. One of the earliest uh, such stories is recorded uh, in the uh, Shanama uh, concerning the reign of the Sassanian king by the name of Bahram uh, V. According to this story, uh, the king of the Sassanian Empire asked the king of India uh, to send him 10,000 loot plane experts known as the Luris, uh, both men and women, in order to teach the poor in his realm to appreciate music and dance. Yeah. Uh, as a special gift to the Luris, King Bahram uh, V gave each one an ox, also each one a donkey, and also one donkey load of wheat so that the Luris uh, could be self-sufficient and start their uh, farms uh, outright. And so that way they could focus on their music and their dance, uh, teaching his subjects how to do so. Unfortunately, according to the story, rather than use the wheat to plant and the, uh, the oxen to plow their fields, they ate both of them right out. <laughs> So angry at how wasteful uh, they were, King Bahram V ordered them out of his empire, uh, telling them to pack up their bags and go. And so they began to wander about. Obviously, this is there's aspects of the story that are apocryphal, but at the same time, there are aspects that are 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 real. Uh, they were already involved in migrations. They were also very much uh, connected to the arts of music and dance. Uh, so that is true. I doubt that they were so wasteful. Uh, but uh, anyway, at this same time, this migratory people received a general name, that being known as the Zot, uh, Z-O-T-T. That's the first, you know, so we have stories. We'll tell more stories, don't worry about, we'll go through their migrations uh, and we'll tell stories about what they left behind as they move forward towards Europe. Second, uh, after investigating the Romani language, their very words are directly connected to both Hindi and Punjabi. And the phonology, uh, is of uh, the Marwari area, and the language construction is from Bengal. So the language has Indian roots. Isn't that fascinating, right? So now the Romani has a sister language that's known as Domari, which is connected to the migrating uh, people known as the Dom. As opposed to the Rome, <laughs> you have another people called the Dom, and um, and they speak a related language uh, for the Romani. But um, but this uh, the second group uh, uh, they migrated a little bit later afterwards. Uh, also, um, I want to mention this that when it comes to both the Romani and the Domari, uh, what their numerals. Uh, happen to be either Hindi or Persian, with the exception of seven, eight, and nine, which is borrowed from the Greek. So, so okay, so we have number one, we've got stories that we'll tell more that arrive from, start off in India. Are you guys getting this? So we have a narrative that traces the gypsies back to India through various stories along the way. Now we have the language itself that is derived from India. And we can see how it goes, uh, morphs and changes as it goes along the way. Uh, it's now time to go uh, with the third pillar. It's called genetic research. Uh, we're gonna go right there. And uh, ever since 2012, it is amazing how much we've learned about the gypsies, the Romani. It turns out that we can detect 
the genetic sense that the Romani left India 1,500 years ago. We can identify it, which is, by the way, very close to the exact date of the story of King Baran, the one we just, the one we just talked about, right? Furthermore, according to the same research, they reached the Balkans, Eastern Europe, around 900 years ago, so around 1100 CE. Also, genetic research, that's, if you, I'll give you the source, it's from the European Journal of Human Genetics, okay, reveal that over 70%, 70% of males belong to a single lineage that is very unique amongst the Roma. So there is a connection. Let's go a little bit further. In fact, 47.3% of Romani men carry the Y chromosome of Halpo group known as HM82, which is rare outside of South Asia. In fact, the uh, mitochondria Halpo group M, which is most common in Indian subjects and rare outside Southern Asia accounts for nearly 30% of the Romani people. In fact, the Polish Roma specifically are of the M5 lineage, which is exclusively from India and nowhere else. That is not enough. A specific kind of disorder uh, that is a mesothenia. Uh, it's a congenital uh, situation, is found in Romanized subjects and is caused by what is known as the uh, 1267 DELG mutation, which is only known uh, from people of Indian ancestry. You want to have proof? You want to have evidence? There it is. It's ironclad. The gypsies are from India. Isn't that cool? <laughs> they're, from, they're from India. And they came from there, and as they migrated across, they intermarried with various groups as they went along. So that's why you'll have uh, a genetic diversity. But we have to realize that, you know, if you guys remember the old Punnett Square, remember this? You know, a recessive dominant genes. You also have those lineages also moving through the gypsies uh, as well. I could even go further into the uh, Y chromosome helper groups. Uh, but I think I think we're overwhelmed as it is. Yeah, so they're from there. Now, moving on. As for tracing the migration route of the gypsies, from what can be established through uh, linguistic, uh, through genetic and historical evidence, they originated from, I'll tell you exactly where they're from, Rajasthan in India. And from there, they settled into the Punjab, Seen and the Balkistan about 250 BCE, 250 BCE, and they were there for a long time. I don't know if many of you are familiar with Rajasthan, but if you ever have a chance, uh, you could go ahead uh, and just you know Google pictures of people from Rajasthan, and you'll realize that uh, many of the clothing and outfit outfits and the colorfulness of it all, and even the jewelry resembles gypsy jewelry and gypsy outfits. Isn't that fascinating? Some of those traditions continue on. I, I love Rajasthan uh, uh, outfits. It's pretty amazing. And of course, the Rajasthani are also known for their dancing and also for their music. So it is fitting. Okay, well, we know that uh, basically the, the gypsies, or who would become known as the gypsies, thrived in India, uh, especially in Western India for some time. Then around between four to 500 CE, okay? So not 250 BCE, now it's 400 to 500 CE, they were on the move again. Question is why? Why are they suddenly moving? Of course, you know, we have the story of the Luris and King Bahram the, the fifth. We talked about that, which 
fits in nicely here. It, it, it is pretty close in proximity to the same period of time. Uh, but we also know um, that uh, there are some movements going on in a migratory sense. India is being upset during the Ford 500s uh, CE. Uh, lots of changes are going on uh, that, are, that are unsettling and forcing them to, to move, but we don't know all the details. It is still shrouded in mystery. We do know that there is another interruption that forces them to move again. Uh, and this is during the time of Mahmud of Ghazni, uh, who reigned from 971 to 1030 CE. Uh, and so we have you have that. You, you also have, so, so the people are kind of being uh, tossed and turned a little bit. But what will happen uh, is that it turns out that the, the, the gypsies, or who become the gypsies, are migrating across the Middle East between 600 to 1000 CE. Uh, and uh, but we don't know exactly where they are, but we do know that they arrive around uh, the 1000 uh, CE. And where they arrive, actually they, they arrive a little earlier, I should say this, uh, they, they arrive, start arriving around, um, how do I put this? They, 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 uh, groups of them uh, arrive first. I'll, I'll be more clear about this. The Rome are not migrating always together as one group. You have, you have, you have various migrations that happen over a span of a hundred years. I know we want them all to be together. We picture these images of them all traveling as one. That will happen. No problem. But at this point. Uh, it's, a, it's a little less systematic and gradual. Uh, you have some reaching uh, Asia Minor, which is Turkey, around 1,000. But you have earlier groups that arrived as early as the 800s. Uh, but this is a problem. You'll see what happens. Uh, it would have been better for them to arrive all as one group, because if they arrived all as one massive group, we can identify them easily. The problem is, is it came in littles to what is now Turkey in small groups, and they got mixed up with another group of people because there is not as many of them at once. I want you to follow what happened because this is important historically. What happens is they get mixed up with a Christian heresy. <laughs> you just can't make this up. Okay. so. They get confused with another group. They arrive uh, at the the edge of what is known as the Byzantine Empire, the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, and they arrive in an area uh, known as Lyconia and Phrygia. And I'll tell you a little secret. They're still there. They're still in Lyconia. They're still in Phrygia. Uh, they're still in Turkey, those, those very same gypsies. So gypsies, not always, they, they oftentimes stay as they, as they go to various places. Uh, I had an opportunity uh, when I was in Turkey. Uh, I've been to Turkey a few times. This was in the year uh, 2008. Uh, and I was exploring uh, an ancient city by the name of Nicaea. Uh, which is, is Nik uh, today. And I ran into three wonderful gentlemen. One was a educator. He's a scholar. Uh, one was a retired uh, captain of the Navy. And the other was a philosopher. And I was actually in a, uh, a ancient uh, theater uh, from Roman times. I ran into these three people. And, um, and I start hanging around with them. And they said, you know, we're here for a certain reason. I said, well, what are you here for? Well, we're going to go up the hill because uh, we're going to meet somebody. So we went up the hill behind this ancient city. And there was an old gypsy woman. And, and I have pictures. And they sat around her and they interviewed her, asking her questions about her beliefs and her her. her her, her um, uh, various things related to 
uh, the combination of Islam with her beliefs. Her, she talked about spirits and how they operated with the nature. Uh, she talked about uh, local magic. She talked about the evil eye. She talked about various other kinds of rituals that she does. Uh, and she talked about fortune telling. And these, these three were writing this all down. I'm going, what a great opportunity. And she was so old. But she remembered the times before World War II and uh, the old traditions. Uh, and um, yeah, the gypsies are still there. Okay, sorry, that was a fun story. But uh, so what happens uh, is they get mixed up uh, because they arrive so slowly. And the group is known uh, as the, uh, the Anthiganoi. Uh, I'll spell it out. The Anthiganoi is A-T-H-I-N-G-A-N-O-I. Yeah, a, a, a thing annoy. Basically, uh, you, you put an alpha in front of something, it means it's, it's, uh, you are undoing it because the word thigano means to touch. Thigano means to touch. So if theist, if you throw in an A in front of it, atheist, are you guys following this? So if you throw an alpha in front of, front of thigano, it goes from touch to, can anybody say it? Untouchable. <laughs> they are the untouchables. Does that you're going, wait a second, that's interesting. Because in many cases, some scholars of the gypsies say that the gypsies in India were understood as being connected to the untouchables. And it is said that that's one of the reasons why they're migrating from place to place, because they're being rejected. Well, they're getting mixed up with another group of individuals, these Christians, who are also known as the untouchables. Of course, the question is, it's the chicken and egg kind of thing. Which came first? Was it the gypsies that gave the name to the heresy? Or was it the heresy that gave the name to the gypsies? We don't know for sure. Uh, and I love the ambiguity of it all. Okay, so the uh, uh they were thriving during the eighth and ninth centuries. And they're getting mixed up uh, with the gypsies. Uh, the Athenoi, they are monarchists. They emphasize that God as was one person in nature and not three as in the Trinity. But, and they had threw in aspects of a belief system known as Manichaeism thrown in for good matter. But the Romani, because they migrated to the very same region of the Athenoi, the Greeks began to associate the two groups and as one. They got confused between the religion and the people. And so uh, some people say maybe the Romani adopted the Athigonoi beliefs. Other people say maybe the Athigonoi adopted the Romani beliefs. Once again, I love the ambiguity of it all. No matter what, however, the Athigonoi were famous for being practitioners of the magical art. They are considered very much involved into fortune telling and magic and reading signs and wonders. Does this sound familiar? And so the Greeks thought of them as these magical folk. So around 800 uh, CE, a certain Saint Athanasius was said to provide food for foreigners called the Athigonoi uh, in the area of Thrace across the Bosphorus. So it looks like this migratory group, uh, some of them reached Europe around that time. Three years later, in the eight year 803, Theophanes, the confessor, wrote to the Byzantine emperor by the name of Mistorus I that the Athigonoi help stop a riot through, quote, their knowledge of magic. They stopped the riot. What year? 803. While the Manichaean sect that mixed with Christianity faded away by the 11th century, the name Athigonoi now is associated with the gypsies. Yep, the heresy maybe went away, 
but the Egyptians got this name. So when you're looking through documents in the Byzantine Empire about the Gypsies, you don't look under the word Gypsy, you don't look under the name Romani, you look under the name Athiganoi. Is that helpful? Athiganoi are at this point the one and the same with the Gypsies. Okay. And um, in 1054, during the reign of Constantine of the Ninth, Various itinerant fortune tellers, ventriloquists, and wizards visited him, and they were called the Higanoi. Here we go, more specifics. Now, already by 1054, the gypsies are known for being ventriloquists, fortune tellers, and wizards. Once again, connecting them to their magical aspect, right? This is according to the life of St. George the Anchorite, right? Uh, also, uh, we know that the Iganoi were called on by Constantine to help rid his forests of the wild animals that were killing off his livestock. Why not? <laughs> so, uh, what is important here is that the Egyptians are connected with fortune telling and magic, which they still have that reputation to this day. So where do we first learn about that reputation? from the Byzantine sources. Remember earlier, we hear about the reputation of music and dancing from Bahrain, the, the, you know, the fifth. But when it comes to the magical aspects, uh, that comes about 500 years later uh, in the Byzantine Empire. Aren't you glad you're hearing all this information? I'm kind of getting rid of, of all these misperceptions right away. And it's nice to have some clarity as opposed to saying, where are the gypsies from? I don't know. <laughs> now you know exactly where they're from. Now, according to the uh, genetic studies, uh, gypsies arrived in the Balkans around 1100 CE. Uh, although there's no records of them, we know they arrived there. Uh, the first direct historical evidence for gypsies in Europe beyond the Byzantine Empire arrives around the 14th century, well, 1322, if you want the exact, when a certain Simon Simonius, who is an Irish Franciscan monk, came across a group of migrants he called the descendants of Cain. That's not a, it's not a very flattering description. Uh, uh, here, the gypsies uh, were hanging around the town of Heraclion, which is on the island of Crete. So they're getting a bad reputation. If you're calling them descendants of Cain, you could see that there must be, you know, raising Cain. <laughs> and not sugarcane. Stopping now. The next reference uh, concerning the gypsies arrived uh, from uh, Ludolphus of Suheim in 1350, saying that they spoke a language. It's important. Spoke a language, 1350. That's called Mandapolis. Mandapolis is the language. Why is that? What is it? Why is that important? Well, if you know the root, the root of the word is montis. And what does that mean? It means prophet or fortune telling. So he's saying that they're speaking the language of fortune telling. And that is 1350. Ten years later, 1360, we find evidence of a fiefdom on the island of Corfu that used only Romanized serfs. Uh, and the fiefdom was called the Feudum Akinotum, which is ultimately under the authority of the Republic of Venice. We know that the first recorded actual gypsy slave stems from Wallachia, or Wallachia, uh, in the Balkans. In fact, in both Wallachia and Moldavia, gypsies were often forced to be slaves. Now, here we go. So the beginning of the enslavement, the big way of, of gypsies, starts uh, in the Balkans. Uh, during the 1300s. And unfortunately, the enslavement of these gypsies in this area would continue until 1856. They were slaves. Do you realize that? Yeah. In Moravia, gypsy women were set aside to have their ears severed. This happened also in Bohemia. So persecutions are starting. They're migratory people. 
Nobody wants to have them around. Now they're moving in larger groups. And in larger groups, they seem more of a threat to many people. And they, they try, they beg for sustenance, and people don't want to give it to them. And so they have to steal food, survive. And so uh, this starts a, a very unhappy relationship between gypsies and the peoples of Europe. They moved around, by the way, by this point, in covered wagons. That's why the national flag uh, has the spoked wheel, right? Now, the gypsies split into two different groups, with one group migrating northward into Central Europe, reaching German lands by 1417. The, in fact, the Holy Roman Emperor, by the name of uh, Sigismund, guaranteed safe conduct into his domain by his own personal orders. So, the, so that was seen to be good, but unfortunately, their reception was not always positive there either. For already in the Meissen region of Germany, they ordered them expelled the year before he approved them uh, in 1416. And they're also expelled from Lucerne in 1471. In other places, uh, in the German realms, they took their children away and forced them into labor. So I know we hear stories about the new gypsies stealing children. You know, uh, yeah, have you heard the stories about the people stealing the gypsy children away from them? Yeah, this happened a lot. And we got to be very careful about these stereotypes. And unfortunately, the stereotypes of gypsies continue to this, to this day. Okay. Situations grew worse in Switzerland, uh, where they're all ordered, all gypsies were ordered to be put to death in the year 1510. Any gypsy found were to be, were, were to be killed. Uh, this is uh, attempts of ethnic cleansing already at that period of time. It gets worse. The German realms, you can't protect the gypsies. In 1545, at the Diet of Augsburg, it declared that, quote, whoever kills a gypsy will be guilty of no murder, unquote. The resulting slaughter was so intense that the government had to make qualifications to, quote, forbid the drowning of Romani women and children, unquote. So persecutions go all the way back. Then this group went to Denmark, right, and Sweden. They're ordered out of Sweden in 1525. They're ordered to be put to death in Denmark in 1536. Isn't this tragic hearing this story? I mean, it's pretty upsetting. I mean, okay. The other group of the Romani migrants uh, went southeast. It went southeast. They passed through Italy and then arrived in the Iberian Peninsula uh, during the 15th century. In 1493, the gypsies were expelled from Milan. In 1512, the gypsies were expelled from Catalonia. In, by 1538, Portugal began to deport the gypsies to the colonies. Eventually, these two groups met, and where did they meet? France. So they met back in France in 1500. By 1504, they were already ordered out of the country, four years later. And here, gypsy women were branded with their head shaved to humiliate them. This is, this is horrendous, right? So where can the gypsies go? They go across to England. Perhaps England will welcome them, right? They arrived in England and Scotland around 1500. But in 1530, the gypsies were ordered out of England as expressed by the Egyptian Act, which accused gypsies of deceiving people to get their money, especially by telling their fortunes. So I will read the edict right now from 1530. So this is a quote about the gypsies of 1530. It says, stating, an outlandish people, this is quote, calling themselves Egyptians, using no craft, nor feet of merchandise, 
who have come into this realm, gone from shire to shire and place to place in great company. So you see already, there's a problem with how many people travel together. So when they arrive, the fear is the depletion of resources, right? Whether it be agricultural or otherwise. And they use great subtlety and crafty means to deceive the people, bearing them in hand that they, by palmistry, you know, reading hands, could tell men's and women's fortunes. And so many times uh, by craft and subtlety have deceived the people for their money and also have committed many heinous felonies and robberies to the great hurt and deceit of the people that they have come among. So, of course, the claim is that they're using uh, their magic uh, to manipulate and trick the people, uh, and also, of course, that they're committing these crimes. Because of these supposed crimes, all gypsies were given 16 days to leave. Quote, the Egyptians now being in this realm have uh, been asked to depart within 16 days. From henceforth, no such person be suffered to come within this king's realm. And if they do, then they and every of them in so doing shall forfeit to the king of sovereign lord all their goods and titles and then be commanded to avoid the realm within 15 days under pain of imprisonment. Well, the Egyptians, I'm doing it, I'm doing it now. <laughs> the gypsies, they came back. They came back uh, and um, and then Mary, you know, you know, Bloody Mary, she earns that reputation, 1553 to 1558. Uh, she decided that they have to be put to death. Uh, another crime that goes to her feet. She claimed that the Egyptians were plying their devilish and naughty practices and devices, unquote. Eventually, uh, so that was, uh, that was Bloody Mary. Eventually, England relaxed its anti-gypsy uh, uh, policy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Queen Elizabeth I. Good stuff. Finally, uh, that's 1596. The Romani were given special privileges that many other migrant uh, peoples lacked. And so uh, that's some good news. Thank you, Elizabeth. All right. So good job. So, um, meanwhile, uh, eventually France in 1683 uh, also passed laws to protect gypsies. All right. Well, it looks like the gypsies are not being very well treated in Western Europe. So where are they going to go? Eastern Europe. So, so they went towards tolerant Poland and Russia. You guys ever heard of Catherine the Great? Right? Catherine uh, reigned from you know, 1729 to 1796. She asserted that the gypsies were good, that we want them here. And they were to be called crown slaves, which was one step from the simple serfs. I know it doesn't sound very good, but there was a special honor to be above the serfs. If you know the history of Russia, anything is better than being the serf. Uh, serfs up, actually it never is. Still, they were not allowed in parts of, of Moscow. Uh, and as long as the gypsies paid their taxes, they were left alone uh, in peace. Of course, the problem is they kept moving. Uh, all right. Uh, so, well, so now you have gypsies being accepted in Poland, in Russia. That's a good thing. You got gypsies finally being uh, recognized in England and finally in France so they could survive, right? But then we have the rise of Adolf Hitler. This is a very sad moment. The Romani uh, people uh, pronounce this period of time as the Poromos, Poremos in some cases, basically just means the devouring. Uh, the Nazi genocide of the Romani during the Holocaust uh, is, is hard to fathom. 
we don't know how many were killed. We really don't know. Uh, gypsy uh, communities were not as coherent or <laughs> as Jewish communities. You know, they sometimes defied the census. You couldn't get a count of them because they're always moving. So some some have it as low as 500,000, which is ridiculous. It's not true. Some have it as high as 1.5 million. But the reality is, uh, scholars today say it was a lot higher. The problem is we don't know how much. Um, you know what the claim was? Uh, the Nazi ideology taught that the Romani were racially inferior, along with Blacks and Jews, claiming that they're non-Aryan. I, I, I have to laugh at this because the Romani are, are, are Indo-European, which is Aryan. In fact, their roots are probably more Aryan than the Germans. Okay, moving right along. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, well, because remember the Indo-Europeans, they came from around 5,000 BC. There are the Caucasus Mountains. And one group went south, even Hittites. One group went west. And they became, of course, the Slavic Germanic groups. Another group went east. They became the Iranian groups and then continued on. And they're the northern Indians. You know where the gypsies are from. And a lot of their DNA is Indo-European, which is Aryan. Uh, so Hitler was wrong. <laughs> Ignorant completely of it. Okay. Uh, we know that uh, Rome and I uh, were placed into Dachau. Uh, there were the Ravensbrück, the Buchwald, and other herbs. Um, the Nazis slaughtered so many gypsies in the protectorate of Bohemia, of Moravia, that the Bohemian Romani language is now extinct. In fact, uh, they, they kill the majority of the gypsies in the entire Baltic region, wiped out. Uh, they never got to Denmark or Greece, thank goodness, but the, the gypsies of Croatia were wiped out by the Italian fascists. They wiped completely out. So, so when I say uh, maybe over 1.5 million, I'm not exaggerating. Uh, they emptied it up, right? Uh, it's very upsetting. Okay, so because of that, this is the problem. Because of that, a lot of gypsy traditions, as you may expect, were broken at that time, right? Because so many were killed. But you know, what place is missing is the Americas. The gypsies were also going to the Americas. And so what is fascinating, uh, if some of you have a gypsy background, you know this, is that some of the old roots are sometimes found in the new world. <laughs> and some of those old practices, uh, the gypsies, uh, you know, uh, carried on their traditional ways of moving around wagons uh, uh, throughout the countryside for a long period of time. I remember my dad, uh, you know, still around. <laughs> he's, he's, he talks about uh, how the gypsies would come into Isla and uh, they go through their wagons and they, they arrive outside of Pella, Iowa, and they would do the complete, uh, make it a ring. <laughs> And they would have uh, you know, the fire in the middle of the camp area, uh, and they'd have the dancing, and they have the singing, and of course, all those conservative Dutch people tell them, would say, "Keep your kids indoors; they're going to steal them away." <laughs> you know, so they're you know they're they're worried about little Ronnie. My dad would be taken away by the gypsies. That was always, but you know what? That was a convenient threat. It just basically is we don't want you. Uh, out late at night, so maybe the gypsies will get you. They'll, they'll, they'll get you indoors. Uh, there were, were some cases where kids were taken away, they, you know, so there were those during the 40s and 50s, so not everything's an exact exaggeration, but uh, for the most part, that didn't happen. Uh, gypsy communities uh, are still so large, you can't get away with taking a kid. <laughs> Where are they going to go? <laughs> Slow wheels moving off, you know, 
uh, you know, especially in the age of the automobile. Uh, no, no. So anyway, you get my point. Uh, it's a lot of that is urban legend that spun around, but people do enjoy uh, doing that too much uh, from the memory of him, as well as the memory of other people I know. They found the gypsies entirely wonderful. They, they, you know, they are great. You know, you you go there and uh, they would give you. You know, they have so little, and they give you everything they have. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, you know, hey, you know. So they were very hospitable. You know, you, although they had cleanliness practices, which we'll talk about, they do have that. Uh, at the same time, they are oftentimes very generous uh, and very happy to be with you. Uh, and um, uh, so there is a good legacy here, right? That we forget, that needs to be remembered. So let's talk about the uh, gypsy uh, ideas or beliefs uh, in general about, okay, so here we go. A catch all uh, phrase for the Romani philosophy of life, inclusive of their independent wandering spirit, and their culture and, and their laws and their beliefs, is known as Romanpen. Romanpen, R O M A N I P N. Unfortunately, Romanpen, uh, a lot of that was broken up uh, during the time of the Nazis. So some of those traditions uh, disappeared among some gypsies. I did this talk one time before, actually twice before, and I had some gypsies in the audience. It's interesting because gypsies from different backgrounds. So one gypsy said, yeah, that's exactly what we do. The other gypsies are all, we don't do that at all. <laughs> and they're adamant about it, you know. Uh, and uh, one was an Adams. You guys, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with that name. Uh, a lot of gypsies uh, in the California area uh, have the name Adams as their last name. How many people do that? Adams. As in. Okay, moving right along. You can make them do web searches and they go, wow, look at that. Yeah, Adams is a, is a, is a popular survey. Okay, so Roma Pond. It, now, uh, now, they do have, um, oh, where was I? Oh, yeah. According to Roma Pond uh, standards, the tribal leader was called the Rom Baro, uh, who gains this position not by birth, I like this, but through the merit of his abilities. And the wisdom of his counsel. So, so he's not he's not there because he was born to privilege. He's he's there because he proved himself to be worthy of the position. It's unfortunately that it's patriarchal. That's the only drawback. Uh, so uh, these big men, these these leaders, uh, were usually very intelligent, uh, good at strategies. Uh, they usually do the local languages quite well so they can communicate. Um, so that, you know, they, um, uh, they did have uh, uh, elaborate uh, purity laws that they enforced as well. Now, uh, there is another little bit here. Uh, they talk about the designations Gajo and Gaji. The word gajo, G-A-D-J-O, and gaji, G-A-D-J-I, that's a reference to those who are non-Romani. So they're like, you know, it would be like Jews calling Gentiles. That'd be a good example, right? Uh, of course, the question is, where does the word come from? Uh, it's under debate. Some people say it's a, der a derivation of the word village. And since uh, uh, the uh, Romani uh, travel from place to place and usually don't settle in a village, they do later on, the idea is those village dwellers, you know, those villagers who cause us all of these problems. Uh, now, without question, I got to tell you, uh, the gypsies are all about family. Uh, and when I talk about family, I'm talking about extended family. And when I'm talking about family also, I'm talking about let's have as many kids as possible. These families are huge, right? Uh, so, in fact, you need to get started as early as possible 
to have as many kids as possible. Uh, so uh, the idea of sex before marriage uh, was, was not, uh, not looked upon with great fondness because everybody knows that as soon as the woman enters puberty, she needs to be married. Well, how early is that? Well, if she's 12 years old, hits puberty, congratulations. It's time to get married. Unfortunately, if you're 10 years old, you hit puberty, congratulations. You just got married. That was, uh, so that was the child marriage was practiced by the Roman uh, and That's obviously ceased. Although still today, you do have early marriages amongst gypsies. You still have the early marriage idea. Now, according uh, to Roman I law, when a gypsy man wishes to marry, uh, he has to pay, of course, obviously, uh, a bride price to the girl's family. And I'm joking, because think about it. Wait, bride's price? It doesn't go the other way around? It does, in, 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 his, in a historical sense. Uh, usually, it is the other way around, right? You know? Uh, but uh, in, in gypsy culture, uh, it is the groom who pays the bridal price. So there is something there. Okay, so now you're thinking, okay, so yeah, yeah, but that's kind of strange, but still patriarchy. Yeah, but things change. Let's go there right now. Uh, following marriage, of course, the, the wife's duty is to please the husband as much as possible, to have lots of children, and to nurture them. Yeah, in fact, in fact the wife has not only to take care of, uh, of her in-laws, but his in-laws. A lot of work. And, of, of course, the, the father looks like a great potter familias. He's in charge of everything. He has the authority. In fact, uh, in a Romani family, in the oldest living male in the family is in charge, whether that's a grandpa, a great uncle, a father, a brother, right? Whoever's the oldest living male is the one in charge. And at first, women don't have much power. What do you mean? First, with every child the mother has, she gains more power. The more kids she has, the more power she has, the more say she has. And if she has lots of kids, I got to tell you, she's now in charge. So, so the, the having children adds to their powerful collateral. Uh, and so as a result, they became uh, look, they're looked upon as wise and worthy of great advice because they had so many children. They must be blessed by nature. Is this making sense? So you do have a, an interesting change. The tipsies, of course, are very much into purity laws, which mirror, by the way, Hindu purity laws in many ways. Even today, these purity laws are known as marim and marahim, M-A-R-I-M-E. These laws, of course, apply to every aspect of, of life. Uh, and there's impurity everywhere. One area of impurity, unfortunately, is the genitalia region. Uh, in fact, the entire lower part of your body uh, is considered impure. So that means that when you do your wash, you everything from the waist down is washed separately. It cannot mix with what is washed above. They don't, so they separate these two areas. Uh, so that's an interesting thing. And of course, women, unfortunately, during uh, menstruation are considered impure. In childbirth, childbirth should be done uh, in a very careful way, but it's also understood as impurity. And so that means that they have to be isolated for so many days after having their kid, which is unfortunate. The dead, of course, are to be buried, not cremated. But when somebody dies, the entire family has to go in isolation because they're considered impure after being in, in close touch with those who die. Everybody stays away from them for a period of time. Okay? Impurity rules extend to animals. So how can you tell which animals are clean or unclean? Here it is. 
any animal that can lick their butts are considered unclean. Anyone that can lick their behind, they won't touch. Hey, wait a minute, that's cats. Twin gypsies don't like cats. Hey, that's dogs. Gypsies don't like dogs. Although I know gypsies have had dogs, but whatever. So what, what animals uh, don't do that? Horses. Gypsies love horses. Wow. Yeah, they're very close. In fact, many gypsies were involved in the raising of horses. Right? That became a, a great trade because they could travel anywhere around and still raise horses through migration. So that was a great, so not just musical instruments and dancing, you know, not just palmistry, fortune telling, but they could, but, but they're very much involved in the horse trade. You break them in and they sell them from place to place and anything they can move with them, they would do so. Uh, they're also, uh, I believe in another interesting bit is that they, they believe in the concept known as Kuntari. Uh, K-U-N-T-A-R-I, which is the concept of universal balance, that everything have, has its place, you know, for the birds, uh, their place is the sky, right? Uh, for fish, their natural place is, well, the water. Uh, what about the chicken? <laughs> it has wings, but can't fly. So it's out of balance. So guess what? The gypsies say, the chicken, it's bad luck. It can't decide if it's the sky or if it's it's the land. <laughs> so they do not eat chicken eggs, oftentimes, the result. Is this fascinating? Oh, frogs also are a problem. You know, frogs are neither in the water or the land. So frogs and toads, uh, because they can't make up their mind which realm they're a part of, they're considered evil and connected to black magic. This is where you get the stories of somebody being turned into a toad or a frog, right? This is where the evil ideas, <coughs> if you're hearing about <coughs> medieval legends about uh, witches, they're always having, you know, you know, the toads and the frogs and so forth and black magical rituals, supposedly. This, again, is connected to these ideas. Uh, the gypsies love wearing... Uh, for so many centuries, very colorful clothing. Yellow is a favorite. Uh, here, you know, kerchiefs and beads. Uh, gypsy men like yellow necklaces. Very, very bright colors. But then again, you would expect that because the gypsies come out of that Rajasthani, Western Indian culture, which is very colorful. And so, yeah, they're part of that. Uh, uh, gypsies. Uh, uh, they uh, believe that their image uh, is sacred, their souls are sacred, and, uh, and they are leery of anybody snatching their souls away. Uh, for some reason, what happened is, is that when photography came about, in the old days of the big you know, powder, they thought the big light was stealing their souls away. And this tradition continues on. So many gypsies believe that, you know, if you take a picture of somebody, you take their soul away. Well, anyway, uh, Rome and I uh, were, like I said, into various trades. They're into art, uh, dance, music, uh, raising horses, uh, anything that is portable. Uh, you know, they developed uh, various kinds of dances. Flamenco was very popular, by the way. Uh, and, um, you know, what's what's one of the more portable kind of instruments? Well, uh, the guitar, right? You can, you know, the guitar, you know, as, as opposed to a pipe organ, right? You can't, you can't go around, uh, you know, the pipe organ, but you can go around with a guitar. So guitar becomes a primary uh, instrument, uh, the zither, the harp, and the violin. Oh, the violin. Um, in fact, uh, uh, they are amazing uh, at playing the violin. They can play by ear, by heart, whatever they they they, they please. They're great at improv you know improvising various things. Um, uh, they uh, 
but they, they, they play with no notes. They don't, don't, don't read notes. They just play uh, from the heart. It's haunting uh, melodies that also connect with microtones. I mean, they're very much into the, the minor keys and the, and the music just kind of serpentine that moves about uh, and has a leftover of lineages and ideas that go all the way back to India. So some of the same notes you can hear moving to and fro and cascading about uh, through the violin. And, and the cool part is sometimes the violin takes the place of a person's voice. Where the voice used to go is where the violin goes. But in some cases, the voice still goes in those areas, haunting and moving about. Is this cool? You guys are learning things, right, about the, about the gypsies? Okay. Uh, the gypsies, other things about them. Uh, let's talk about their beliefs. I'm looking at my time, although I think we're covering quite a bit of information. Yeah, see, so yeah, okay. Um, the Romani were, of course, followers of Hinduism at first, and uh, or paganism uh, as they migrated westward. And then, of course, they adopted whatever the predominant religion was in the area. Uh, some converted to Christianity, some converted to Islam, but always there is this substructure of beliefs that resides beneath uh, these ideas. Uh, for example, gypsies um, who are Muslim uh, are today in Turkey, Bosnia, Czechoslovenia, Albania, Bulgaria, Macedonia, Kosovo, and Egypt. Gypsies in Greece are almost always Greek Orthodox. Here's the problem. In their own belief, they call God Devla. D-E-V-L-A. Devla. You see, uh, Devla is a, uh, their, uh, the rise from the Sanskrit noun, Deva. Devla, Deva. A God. But because it's an Indo-European root, you know, Caucasian root, you know, Aryan root, it also connects to words Dios or God or Divinus, right? Deity, right? So, but here's the problem. They will say, who do you worship? And the gypsy will say, we worship Devla. And you know what the Europeans will say? You worship the devil? And there you have a problem. Language. So the gypsies are the ones who worship the devil. Of course, if you ask the gypsy who the devil is, they'll say, well, it's Bing. B-E-N-G. Bing is the devil for them. But unfortunately, um, uh, the words are too close, especially in England. They force these gypsies to come forward and then ask them, who do you worship? They say the devil. And they would kill them based upon that for a while. Uh, not even take, maybe people need to do their research more often, I'm just saying, you know. But anyway, so Bing uh, is the word for devil. It is applied to a, a solitary figure, much like Satan. Uh, but they also have other malevolent demons that are also known as Bings. So you have the devil, but you have also devils, right? And there is this war between the two. The Romane also have a word simply for spirit, and that's Ogi, O-G-H-I, which is connected to the Hindi G. You can see that? And so then they also have various spirits of nature. Well, let's talk about a few. Why not? Let's go there. Okay, so remember, they're still practicing Christianity or Islam, whatever it is, as, but they have as a substructure other spirituality that they also believe. And I do know that for a fact in many cases. That was one thing I learned from the interview with a gypsy woman on top of the hill overlooking ancient Nicaea is that she is a practicing Muslim and she knew all the spirits. And she believed in the spirits and she called upon the spirits and they occupied the various regions. For her, they occupied three different regions. They, they occupied the air, they occupied the water, 
and they occupied the land of the underworld. The three areas. You know, and that was, I learned that in 2008, just sitting before this woman. This is fascinating. And this is true for many. Although I'm going to say this very quickly, there are gypsies who don't believe this at all. It just depends on what the gypsy uh, and how traditional they are and how much uh, World War II got in the way of, of these traditions, which it did get in the way. So let's talk about a few. You have first the aerial spirits. Zachim, uh, Vile, right? Uh, these are spirits of the air, just like in Scripture, the Bible. Uh, they are, the spirits of the air are evil for the for the gypsies. They they're mischievous. They're like uh, I don't know, like Robin Goodfellow. You know, uh, they bewilder and frighten one to madness. You don't want to be haunted uh, by a uh, a air spirit. I do have a story uh, from the South Slovenians, which of course I'm going to tell you anyway. Whether you want to or not. Um, uh, the story goes as follows. One time there was a shepherd by the name of Stanko. I probably end with that name. <laughs> I'll never name a kid Stanko. But anyway, uh, who was very great at playing the flute. So he became so ab absorbed in his music that when he heard the Ava Maria bell ring, uh, he decided that instead of praying, the Ava Maria to the bell, he decided to do something taboo and play the Ava Maria with the flute. This is a gypsy story. Uh, as he ended his song, he saw a villa, an air uh, spirit. And from that hour on, she never left him. Yeah, you know, he, you know, we he eat dinner, she was there by his bed, work or play, there she is. Um, and uh, uh, these unearthly eyes are always looking at him. Uh, he was under her spell. He could never be left alone. Um, you know, they, they, various people try to get the spirit away from him. And you know what that did? It just simply made her mad. <laughs> she became angry. And eventually uh, uh, she said, I want you to, to wander away with me. He said, no. And of course, they found him drowned in the ditch. So you don't tell an aerial spirit no. <laughs> okay, so that's the aerial spirits. Uh, you have also the water sprites, uh, the uh, the Provadine Ville, right? Uh, also known as the Nivashi, N I V A S H I, Nivashi. These are water spirits. Now, these are kind of strange. They're good and friendly as long as you meet the water spirit on land. But if you're swimming in a lake or a river, they're going to drown you. <laughs> so their own element, they're not good. So they're kind of caught between good and evil. While the air spirits are evil, the water spirits are eh, evil, good, on land, good, in the, in the water, evil. And then, of course, you're thinking, well, wait, who are the good spirits? You'll find this surprising. Uh, it is the earth spirits that are the good spirits. The Pozembe Vile, also known as the Puvushi, uh, P U V U S H I. These are the ones that are connected uh, to the earth. Uh, now, uh, these, these uh, earth ones are very interesting. They are noble. Uh, friendly, uh, give wise advice, and extremely ugly. <laughs> it's like, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, they, uh, uh, they, uh, they live under the earth, these giant cities. Uh, they're covered with hair. The one negative aspect is they carry off mortal girls for wives, uh, just to kind of add to the, uh, the mixture. Uh, but um, one story of an earth spirit goes as follows. Yeah, I'm actually going to tell you a story. Why not? One time, a, a young Perufshis woman came up to the world, and she sat in, a, uh, in the fair green forest. She saw a very handsome man sleeping in the shade, and she said, 
What happiness it must be to have such a husband. Mine is so ugly. <laughs> her husband uh, overheard her and reflected. And he says, what a good idea it would be to lend my wife to this young man till she shall have born a family of beautiful children that I can sell them uh, to my rich friends. So he said to his wife, you may live with this youth for 10 years if you will promise to give me either the boys or the girls which you bear him. She agreed. Then, uh, uh, then uh, he uh, uh, sang a song. Kuka, kuka, yay. Do you want this one here? Kuka, kuka, yay. <laughs> so then the young man awoke. Uh, and the goblin offered him much gold and silver for his wife. He took it and lived with her for 10 years. And every year she bore him a son. But then, of course, the husband came back and started to collect. What are you going to give me? All the girls or all the boys? Which one? He said, like, well, guess what? I don't have any girls. I'm keeping the boys. So he was pretty upset by that. And he weeped and he howled, Kuka, Kuka, yay. These are dogs here. Kuka Kukuye. <laughs> Can't make this up. <laughs> That's a one story you're going to remember. Sing it all together. Kuka Kukuye. <laughs> all right. Uh, gypsies are also attracted uh, to the moon. They love the moon. Uh, uh, and there's lots of mysteries connected to the moon power. Uh, and of course, I got to tell you a, a moon story. Uh, it's the gypsy ballad of the sun and the moon. It goes as follows. One day, the sun resolved to marry. During nine years, uh, sorry, di during nine years, drawn by nine fiery horses, he had rolled by heaven and earth as fast as the wind of, or a fiery arrow. But it was in vain that he fatigued his horses. Nowhere could he find a love worthy of him. Nowhere in the universe was one who equaled the beauty of his sister, Helen, the beautiful Helen of the silver tresses. The son went to meet her and thus addressed her, my dear little sister, Helen, Helen of the silver tresses, let us be betrothed for we are made for one another. We are alike, not only in our hair and features, but in our beauty. I have locks of gold and you have locks of silver. My face is shining and splendid and yours is soft and radiant. She responded, oh, my brother, light of the world, one who is pure of all stains, one who has not seen a brother and sister married together because it would be a shameful sin. At this rebuke, the son hid himself and mounted up higher to the throne of God, bent before him and spoke, Lord, our father, the time has come for me to wed, but alas, I cannot find a love worthy of me except for the beautiful Helen of the silver head. God heard him and taken him by the hand, led him to hell to put the fear into his heart and then into paradise to enchant his soul. Then he spoke to him and he said, oh, he said to the son, he said, you know, which would you choose? You know? The, the, the hell or, or heaven. Guess what? The son chose hell. <laughs> he wants he wants Helen of the silver tresses. Oh boy. I can do it. So the wedding day is set, and it's not a very good wedding day. Um uh yes, during the service the lights were extinguished, bells cracked while ringing, the seats turned themselves upside down, which is quite a measure, and the tower shook itself off its face. Even the priests lost their voice. And the sacred robes were torn off their backs. This is a good sign that maybe brothers and sisters should, probably should not be married. But what happened is, is that there's a curse. And so God turned Helen into a silver fish. And she floated away. And then he decided to throw that silver fish into the sky. And that became the moon. But he made a curse to the sun and said that you may chase her, but you never catch her, never have her. And so to this day, he chases her across the skies. It's kind of sad. 
<laughs> Sorry, it's depressing. <clears throat> oh, yes. Full moon, high sea, great man thou shalt be. Red dawning, cloudy sky, bloody death shalt thus die. Pray to the moon when she is round. Luck with you will then abound. What you seek for shall be found on the sea or solid ground. Uh, the, uh, you have also, of course, uh, the gypsies. Uh, I know we're right out of time, but I hope you're having fun, right, going through some of these stories. Um, the gypsies uh, do have a few saints. At, uh, for example, Saint Sarah is viewed as a gypsy saint, also known as Kai Sara, right? Or Kali Sara, which is the Hindu deity of India, right? Connected to gypsies, you know, Kali. So uh, uh, there's a fortress like church in southern France. I've been there at the Santa Maria de la Mar. I spent some time there. And this is the place where supposedly. Say Sarah is buried, and uh, what will happen is the story goes is that when the various two Marys uh, crossed uh, Mary Jacob or Mary Salome, when they arrived, the two Marys arrived at Santa Maria de la Mar. Uh, the hidden, sorry, I should say the version that's told uh, by the gypsies uh, goes as follows: that there was a Sarah. Uh, that was a pagan queen that lived near the Rhone River. And when the Marys arrived in their boat, Sarah proudly taunts them. In response, one of the Marys steps out of the boat and directly upon the rough waters and is able to walk on the water. He, she invites the queen to do the same, not to be outdone. Sarah attempts to do so, but nearly drowns. When the other Mary rescues her, Sarah is humbled, amidst defeat and converts to Christianity. In this form, she is the patron saint of the gypsies. And to this very day, uh, they make pilgrimages there uh, to that place. Um, other things, I know, again, I'm kind of looking through, because, uh, uh, again, we're, we're running out of, out of time. Uh, and that is, is, of course, obviously, fortune telling uh, is very important. Uh, for the gypsies uh, as a revenue stream. I do have here tons of, of gypsy uh, magic. I want to give you a little bit, just a few here. Okay. Uh, here it is. Uh, okay. Right. I want to mention that uh, if you are a, a, a gypsy, if you have seven daughters in a row, the seventh daughter is considered magical and powerful uh, and is able to be a great seer. Isn't that interesting? And she has another ability. And that is, is that uh, when somebody in the household who's a female dies, she puts a bowl of water at their feet. And when they die, their soul goes into the water and she's able to drink the water and their intelligence and their ideas and their wisdom is absorbed into her. So these are special magical women. Uh, once again, it's the seventh one of seven women uh, in a row uh, and considered to have, again, uh, magical powers. For, for the magical man, it's the ninth one that is born in a row. Uh, so they're considered, but it, but it is a big deal to marry uh, one of these. Uh, they, are, they are able to... Um, uh, they're able to do so much. But the problem is there's still a little bit of a curse against them. So what they do is when they see that death is about to happen, get this, they start growing their fingernails really long and their toenails really long so that when they die and they go to hell, they're able to climb out of hell because they have claws and go into heaven. <laughs> yeah. hey, so you got to worry, you know, death is approaching. Uh-oh, looks like you're growing out your nails. That's a lot. Those are, those are really long. Uh, so watch out that. Uh, there are other uh, other little things that happen too. Uh, uh, for example, uh, what about uh, when it comes to um, uh, evil eye? Uh, if gypsies are known, they believe that power moves through the eye. So never look at gypsy if they're giving the evil eye directly because their spirit could go into you and you're in big trouble at that point. 
So you are cursed if they don't like you. Uh, so what you want to do is, if you feel yourself cursed with the evil eye, a remedy for the evil eye is a jar must be first filled with water from a stream. It must be taken with, not against the current that it runs. And then uh, uh, in it are placed seven coals, seven handfuls of meal, and seven cloves of garlic, all of which is put on the fire. When the water begins to boil, it is stirred with a three fork quid, while the wise woman repeats as follows Evil eyes look on thee, may thee here extinguished be. And then seven ravens pluck out the evil eyes. Evil eyes look on thee, may they soon distinguish, extinguish be. Much, much uh, dust in the eyes, thence may they become blind. Evil eyes now look on thee, may they soon extinguish be. May they burn, may they burn in the fire of God. Okay, that really rhyme there at the end. But there you have it. Uh, also, I think you're supposed to do is you take uh, all of your clothes and you burn it. And you know, when you got the evil eye, you get rid of it. You know, um, if you feel like there is a curse uh, on on your on your you know on you a death curse, uh, what you want to do is um, uh, for the uh, the funerary table. Uh, there's a funerary cover uh, that you that you put to your face and you recite a certain word, and it takes that death curse off of you. So. Oh, that's another little bit here uh, and, and there. I'm trying to think of some other fun bits and pieces, although I see that we're, we are almost out of time. But I do want to also mention that uh, uh, that the gypsy blessings are also considered just as powerful. You get, you get blessed by a gypsy, woohoo, good things are happening to you. Uh, unfortunately, gypsies are connected to various tricks. The most famous trick that they're connected to uh, is this. They will arrive in your house and they will say, hey, you know what? You want to make double what you have? Yeah, yeah, okay. So what you want to do is sympathetic magic. You bury your most precious belongings under your house and it will double after I do my special magic. Okay. So what you do is you gather things up, you know, your favorite uh, silverware or goldware or silver, you bury that into the floor. You know, of course, the gypsy knows where it is, right? Uh, but what happens is that she's going to officiate. So what she will do uh, is that she will have uh, a bundle that is the same size on her somewhere. And so they have the official uh, reopening, in which case she will switch the bundles and then she'll say, okay, it's occurring. Wait three weeks and dig it up and you'll have double the amount. Of course, uh, by that point, she's three weeks away. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's nothing in here. <laughs> it's a trick. Yeah, but uh, still, at the same time, uh, we got to be, we be careful with these stereotypes because there are just as many wonderful legends about the gypsies. Uh, uh, I'm going to give just a few more little bits here. Uh, if a maid uh, not only wishes to see her future husband, but also to know the fate that awaits her marriage, she goes to a crossroads by night, sits down on the ground, and imagines a bowl of fried fish and a cup of brandy before her. With this visualization, the image of uh, her future husband will appear. If she is seen reaching for the fish, the marriage will be happy. If she is seen reaching for the cup, the maid will have much to suffer in marriage. If she does not reach for either the fish uh, or the cup, uh, either she or the husband will die within the first year of marriage. <laughs> so you got to be careful. But they do have lots of magic that occurs at the crossroads. It's considered a magical place. And by the way, that goes all the way uh, back into ancient times. Um, all right. But the long and the short of it is, is that uh, uh, gypsy traditions and ideas and beliefs 
are as diverse as the gypsies themselves. The reality is that so much that we know about gypsies are based upon stereotypes of those who do not truly fully understand the inner mysteries. Now, the relationship goes both ways. See, while many people are trying to understand the, the, the gypsies, many gypsies are trying to make sure that you don't understand them, right? They want to keep what they have special. They want to be private. They think they do have something, but they don't want to share everything with the world in that sense. In fact, going all the way back to the Byzantine period, it is just their mysteriousness that creates their allure, that also helps them market themselves. Right? You know, this is this is a part of who they are by nature. They wish to be magical and mysterious. They are those souls that wander across the earth. But with them, they have, you know, a dance in their feet, a song in their heart, uh, and they are the ones uh, who, uh, who believe so strongly in their sense of independence, that nothing is going to weigh them down, nothing is going to hold them back. And for them, that's true freedom, and that's what a gypsy is all about. Thank you. There we go. There we go. Was that fun? I'll, I'll take a picture of everybody that's here still. So, and I get to do the group shot, the gypsies. If you have your cameras, tell me when you're ready. Uh, it's fine, but I have them. I think I'm speaking German. I guess stop. That's weird. I'm tired. All right, ready? One, two, and okay, here we go. Good. There we go. Hey, did you guys enjoy yourselves? Was that fun? Do you, do you feel like you know the gypsies like a little bit more or a little bit less? <laughs> As the gypsies will go, yeah, learn less. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you for yes. Yeah, I have tons of all these fun gypsy stories, but uh, too much, um, too much stuff. Uh, they really do love the violin, that's for sure. There's a lot of stories that go around the violin. Uh, okay, so any any questions? Uh, James, can I can I say something? Sure, you can. Um, have you seen the? I'm sure you've seen the documentary Lacho Dorm. I have heard it. I have not seen it. Um, I I love that documentary. I think you'd appreciate it because what's great is it talks about um gypsies from india okay okay and yeah. and it it talks about them from all over the world but like when you when you brought up the opening of your talk it definitely made perfect sense to how they would originally be from that area yeah. and that that movie i saw maybe 10 years ago and it really opened up my mind to realize just the um the expansion of that entire culture throughout a great section of the world. So it's really fascinating when you brought up what you brought up, just how much it makes sense. So I yeah. really appreciate your talk. And oh, I need to so find much. you a I need to find you a copy of that movie. I need to get one for myself. Cause I, I had a friend who had it on VHS and I hope oh, it's on TV it. at one point. It's a beautiful, beautiful movie. Yeah. Um can you type that into the chat yeah, so looking. that uh, we can all look for it? Um let me see how to do that. Um, I have a chat uh, icon you, at the, on the bottom of the screen. If you just like kind of scroll around, it might pop up. Let me see. Oh, here we go. Let me let me double check that I'm spelling it right. It's a really beautiful documentary on gypsies from all over the world it even goes into south america with the argentinians Latch -o. Okay. 
Yeah, it's a lot of discrimination against Romani. There, there really is. Yeah, it's it's a it's a problem. It, you know, it's a problem in Orange County. You guys know about that, right? Yes, I, I knew that we had a gypsy population in Orange County. Yep. Yeah, I used to work at a jewelry store, and they uh, would come in and sell jewelry to us. Uh, you know, gold by the weight. And one time, one of the uh, younger family members sold us plated chains and uh, my boss called up the dad and said hey <laughs> and they, they fixed it they came and and made it right uh so they're whatever tradition they have uh, about being able to apparently you can cheat other people but you can't cheat your friends or something like that was how it, it was explained to me. And since Ray was a friend, they shouldn't have sold him the, the uh, plated chains. Yeah. yeah. And, and a, a gypsy, gypsy uh, children, uh, they're oftentimes uh, sent begging to businesses uh, that are on, let me just tell you the streets, <laughs> on, um, let's see, Acacia Boulevard, uh, on um, uh, State College, uh, and um, those, those, you know, those business areas, mm -hmm. they, they, they go from, they go to those places. Uh, they're, they're oftentimes around a place called Plastic Color. I never heard of these places. Uh, but uh, yeah, they go up and down and they, they beg the children. And of course, what are you going to do? You know, so they'll give them food and so forth. But uh, so Fullerton, quite a bit. But the problem is, and it is a problem, is that um, Prejudice also keeps so many unemployed. Mm. So it does work the other way. I mean, how are they going to feed themselves? So it's, it's because we are not embracing that we run into these kinds of situations. You know, you, you don't have a culture of cheating. It's not that at all. It's, it's a culture of trying to survive. You know, what would you do if you were in that same situation? You do anything to, to fill your belly, right? To to have sustenance. Uh, but the problem is we're not we're not compassionate enough. We're not kind enough, uh, and that's that's too bad. It's really a, a black eye on us as a society that there's still a problem. So, and wow, World War Two, what happened to them? Did not ask for this, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but, but gypsies are also known for to be very generous, you know, very generous and um, open as well. Curious about their beliefs. They're very mysterious. You know, that's, that's always the point. But that's, again, probably because they were persecuted so often for their beliefs. Going all the way back, you know, they were connected with heresy, as you saw, or, or, or other kinds of beliefs going back to the Byzantine period. So, you know, that's not easy. You know, they're associated with magic going back a thousand years. And magic has a, um, a very uh, mixed view uh, within uh, the world cultures, right? Especially in the West. That means if you're a gypsy, you're a witch, right? So a lot of the witchcraft trials uh, involve uh, involved, uh, gypsies. For after all, they worship Devla. It's just so pathetic. You just can't make this up. Yeah. Oh, I, I think I, I appear to be pontificating again. Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for being here, uh, Shelley. Wonderful. Any other questions? Yeah. But I, I, I go ahead. Is there any other um, books you could recommend? So I got this material, believe it or not, from articles. And I don't okay. know. And I don't, but they're all scattered. I wish. I imagine it would be scattered considering the it's mystery. Really, no, it's really, no, it's too scattered. Yeah, it, it does. It's, it's a little bit. In fact, I have a whole section where I found tons of gypsy stories from gypsies. You know, I have about 15 pages of that, which I didn't read any of those stories. But <laughs> just, I, I have them anyway. But uh, yeah, uh, there's so much, but. The problem is, is that, um, you know, systematic research, it, it can be done and it is done, 
but I didn't run into anything that was terribly useful, you know. You know, and of course, you, online, you, you don't have very good information either. So it's just kind of like. No, you can't ever trust. So, so you, so you got to knit these things together. So there was an article, and I, I think I, I mentioned the article where they got the DNA evidence. That was, yeah, I did mention the journal. I I yes. That. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. So you're going to have, um, and that was, that was important. But um, I wish, you know, um, if you do find something, send it to me. I will. I'll let you know. It's fascinating. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? I believe I found Lacho Drum on uh, YouTube. Yes, it is on there in pieces. Oh, in pieces. Okay. This one is an hour and. Oh, maybe the whole thing minutes. now. Yeah, an hour and 38 minutes. So, oh, uh, like, it, it might just be available for free on YouTube. Well, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Oh, watch it now. Awesome. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm hoping that we, we, we gain some empathy for the, uh, the gypsies too oh, in, the, in the mix. Like I said, I had to give the good and not as good because I have to you know, make sure it's a balanced uh, perspective because you do have certain stereotypes and in many cases, desperate people do desperate things when they can't eat. So, you know, um, any other? How about the instances where the, the children were stolen by the gypsies? Could those have been just runaways who like went to go live with the gypsies? Oh, there are stories. There are stories of people, uh, of, of kids, not kids. They're like, you know, they're early teens who just wish to join the gypsies. Think about it, you know? You got these pretty women, you got the, you know, the dancing, you got the guitar, you got the, you know, the wandering. Yeah. So it's like, hey, you know, you know, and then when they're, they're captured, it's like, no, no, you know, they force me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, as I said before, you can't really kidnap anybody because there's nowhere you can go. Mm -hmm. You know, those wagons don't go that fast. It's like, you know, they're not going to be running away very far. You know, the gypsies took our kids. Well, they're still about 10 miles down the road. If you don't notice, if you don't notice uh, the kid missing, uh, you know, by the time they're uh, a few, like 100 miles away, you're, you know, you're, you should be their, their, their parent anyway. <laughs> Lose a kid. Yeah. So uh, taking babies. I mean, come on. You know, did it happen in the past? Yes, it did happen in the past, but uh, not, not not so much in the modern time. You know, yeah, you, you know, had happened in Eastern Europe uh, and a few other places where there's uh, what's happened. There's war going on. Uh, there's confusion, and then and, and there's villages that are burned and destroyed, and the gypsies will move through. And in some cases, they will take kids. But I will add this: they will also save the kids. Right. So they'll rescue the kids. They don't have parents anymore. They're killed. Also, the gypsies keep on going. The gypsies were the experts at vampires. They're the ones that uh, knew exactly how to take care of a vampire. So uh, if you are in, in, uh, in Eastern Europe, in Latvia, and Bulgaria, and Transylvania, uh, serious, I have all the sources here. Uh, you know, they do believe in vampires uh and it was like okay you know this guy's this, this is a vampire what are we gonna do call the gypsy in uh and he's gonna go and dig the guy up if he looks like he's you know a little bit juicy and uh, you know there's blood coming out of his eyes but he's still is preserved uh the gypsy he'll make sure it's taken care of uh he'll cut off his head and he'll drive a stake all the way down keep him there so uh, so that you know, call it the local gypsy because you know a lot of people don't want to do it. But you know, gypsy, they're they're you know they, they move from place to place, you know. So that stigma uh, doesn't get attached to it. You know, nobody wants to drive a stake through you know Uncle Ernie, <laughs> right? You know, <laughs> I never thought about it that way, <laughs> right? You know, but you ask, I don't think there's any Ernies in Bulgaria, but uh, you know, but you ask the gypsy, they'll do it. Especially at the right price, and they'll do a little, uh, little, little, do a little jig. They'll say a few magical words, you know, that work with it. 
probably made up on the spot. <laughs> but hey, you know, it works. Yeah, so vampire lore, uh, and gypsies, there's a, there's a, there's a connection. Yeah. Also, also the gypsies will artificially make the vampire lore. There'll be, there'll be a problem. Like, it must be a vampire. So, so we can take care of that. You just, at the right price, the right price. Make a deal, make a deal. We'll take care of it. <laughs> That's Eastern Europe. I hope. Any other questions? No. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here. I hope this was fun. Thank and you. It was wonderful. We're doing both. We're doing a Hildegard of, uh, of Bingen next time, which will be extremely interesting. So twenty three. Yep. So right before Christmas, you'll hear, hear about Hildegard, uh, her beliefs, her perspectives, her ideas. It's not who you think she is. She's very much into nature veneration uh, and into various ideas that you may call magical. Uh, and, and we're going to go there. We're actually going to go into some of her writings that will throw you off because she's considered a good Catholic saint who told popes what to do. They listen. And yet, at the same time, her belief system is extremely revolutionary uh, and very controversial. The reason why she was okay is because she lived during the time, the 10, 11 hundreds, where, it, where women were doing better, actually, in the, in the Middle Ages. But as soon as the 1300s arrived, everything is a mess, Black, Black Plague, Hundred Year War, uh, people dying all over the place, and then women lose power they become scapegoats and uh and so uh, mystics like hildegard uh then suddenly became witches in the mindset of the people so hildegard what she does will be considered witchcraft uh 250 years later and yet during her time she was beloved everybody thought she's great and she had a lot of power what we learned from this is that really uh, our current era, the era, sorry, the era that we live in, the context really does determine how we look at individuals. They can be doing the same phenomenology, but it'll be interpreted differently based upon the context. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it says a lot. We'll go into our mood magic too. <laughs> yeah, any other thoughts, right? And of course, obviously, uh, Lilith uh, beginning next year, so. January 13th. There it is. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.